I jumped the gun. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, Office Hours. If you're watching YouTube and you see a little link down there, you can actually join the conversation here by uh, by clicking on that link and joining on Zoom. We have a whole conversation. We have question and answer. We'd love to have you. So uh, so take take a look at that link down there. If you're here uh, in the Zoom and uh, you want to, uh, you're, this is your first time. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Let me show you around a little bit. Uh, you're in. You're probably in the attendees. The difference between the attendees and the panelists is the panelists got here early and they raised their Zoom hand. So they, they hit the raise hand um, so that we knew that they wanted to join. They have to be here before 6.40. We open the doors at six o'clock. Uh, 6 a.m. is uh, when we open the doors right on time. And you can come in. We're not gonna promise anything from six to 6.30. Like from six to 6.30, we're just kind of chatting. Uh, we're having our coffee, getting started. So uh, the, the conversation is all over the place. Sometimes it's technical, sometimes it's not. It's usually pretty interesting though. Uh, at six, between 6.30 and 6.40, we'll distribute the Discord link. The Discord link is where over 600 of us now uh, go hang out and uh, talk uh, about all the things that we're talking about here, but we do it all day. And so um, you can go to disc, you can get the Discord link at 6.30. By the time I do this announcement, the Discord link has expired, so you have to come back another day. At 6.40 or between 6.40 and 6.45, we start the mic checks. Once we've started the mic checks, uh, we've closed the panel. So if you want to be in the panel, if, you, if you're watching here and you think, wow, I just, these guys, they, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, I know the answer to that. <clears throat> then join the panel. Like if, if, you know, if, if you're not joining the panel, then, then you, know, you can't complain. You, you got to figure this out. So just make sure you have good video, good audio, uh, and good internet. And uh, raise your digital hand, uh, your little Zoom hand before 640. And you can, you can join the panel and give your two cents as well. So, um, so that's kind of how that all works. Uh, from seven to eight, we have question and answer. Uh, and it's just general question and answer about media. You'll see uh, in the Q&A area down below, you can ask questions. Our request is that you keep those questions to less than five lines. Uh, we, we have to read these, so you need to make, keep them short. Um, try to really think them out. Uh, the best way to do this is to type it somewhere else and really look at it <laughs> before you uh, uh, before you post it up there so that, so that it's really readable uh, out loud. Um, second is uh, one question per post, which seems to be very complicated, I think, but but it, it, it's a simple rule. Just try to keep it to one question per post. Uh, it makes it very hard for us to kind of break it up and also it's hard for people to vote on. And then finally, no comments. Uh, don't put comments in the questions. Uh, the comments are for the chat area, which you have access to. So so um, take take advantage of that. Um, the uh, uh, If you're not asking questions, do think about voting on them. So vote those questions up that you like the most. Uh, the reason for that is that, that we're figuring out what we're gonna answer first. The first questions we answer were a little bit more verbose. We, we, we pay more attention to it. We, we look at it by the end, you know, we're just trying to get to the end of the hour. So, um, so a lot of them will be yes, no, red, green, you know, there's not gonna, it's gonna be pretty fast. So if you want, if you have some, a burning question that you really want us to look at, top of the hour is better than bottom of the hour. So, um, so and, and also voting on them helps prioritize them so that all of you can decide what we talk about. From eight to nine, we have a second hour uh, almost every day. Uh, today, we have uh, Steve Wright. He is the uh, author of uh, D Digital Compositing for, T for Video and Film. I probably didn't quite get that just right. There we go. Digital Compositing for Film and Video. I almost had it right. Um, and anyway, so Steve Wright is going to be here. Uh, that, that book is often known as the, uh, the Good Book of Wright. Uh, it is how many of us have learned how to do compositing, uh, or at least got started with it. And so um, Steve's an amazing uh, educator. He's going to talk about green screen. So if you're interested in green screen and why it works, we're going to see the inside of Nuke, uh, a lot of other things there. It should be, it should be a lot of fun. So, um, so anyway, so Steve's coming up. Uh, we do that almost every, every, every day. We have some kind of second hour. Um, that's our second hour. Now, normally Saturdays are a long day, but tomorrow is the 4th of July. So we will be just doing Q&A for two hours, both Saturday and Sunday. Um, but, uh, but we, so it's a little bit longer as far as the Q and a, but we're not going to go through the, we usually have other little classes that we do there, but we're going to push that off a week. Anyway, that's the, the basic, uh, introduction. If you, you know, if, if you're watching this and you think, I know somebody who might actually like this, uh, you can share this link. This is the link to share. I think sometimes the wrong links get shared and things get confusing, but that's the, that's the right link to share. So you can share that link. You can put it on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. And if anything that you think anywhere where your friends are or people that you're connected to, um, you can go ahead and share that. And, uh, the bigger, the, the group grows, the, the more we can do together. You know, so, um, so I think that, uh, you know, definitely if we want more people like the people who are showing up. So um, anyway, hopefully we'll, we'll see more. Anyway, uh, next, uh, we're going to go to Chris. Chris is going to start with the questions. Good morning, Alex. First question today is TJ Asher from Minneapolis. He says, for those without a light meter, 
Could the panel describe some techniques to ensure proper exposure on video, especially with cheaper webcams? Go ahead, Bill. So first and foremost, the traditional tool is a waveform monitor on a scope. You can bring those up in most of the common NLEs, and that'll give you a readout of your luminance values. Increasingly, I and I think a lot of people have been going to a secondary thing called false color, which maps colors to exposure. It's on a lot of the monitors out there you can buy, even the relatively inexpensive ones, and it maps the brightness to colors. So if you have a shot and you flip on false color, you can't see the people anymore, but you can see a huge like yellow field that is up at the top of the range of brightness. And then the person's face might be blue and pink, and that'll show you the level of their exposure, how the light's hitting them. And so that's a really good tool for that. So Chris? those are the kind of the two big ones. Yep, Chris. You know, a real guerrilla technique, if you will, is to compare. Um, it, it's really handy, it's something like Zoom, when you know, there's 25, 40 people that all have really good images and you look at it and you go, mine does not look good, as good as the, <laughs> as the others. So right, sometimes yeah. just putting it side by side. And, and if you have multiple cameras with a quad split, you can compare them because they're literally on the same display that's yep. set up the same. Yishai? Adding to the gorilla technique, if you don't have anything, shut off all the light, put the camera on, open your zoom setting go to video look at yourself and start turning light by one light at the time turn your camera uh, your your computer on see how much light come out of your screen and then you get much better slide. idea what's going on but yeah but for overall exposure also um there's a live uh tool that we use called scope box um that that you can get on the mac where you have an sdin and you've got a lot of scopes that are there's uh, jeffrey powers just popped it up and it's a that's a great app to um, kind of look at what you what you have there. Um, uh, go ahead real quick, Leland, and, and then we'll move on. Just as far as technique on the three point lighting, just make sure your intensities are correct. So go search a quick uh, video on three point lighting. You'll see that your intensities are going to change for each light. And Roscoe, 15 seconds. So, sorry, I didn't know you. Uh, uh, real quick, you got to get your monitor properly calibrated, and a super cheap way to do it is get some blue gel, the old Roscoe double blue or two singles, whatever. Put some color bars on your monitor and adjust until you see four equally lit bars on that monitor. Get it calibrated properly, then you can start to work on. And your and your uh, your audio is still breaking up, Roscoe. Um, all right, next question. That was some old school technique there, Roscoe. Uh, Gregory Callahan says, "I'm thinking about ordering." A high PR 40. I have a ATEM 40. I think they mean mini arriving Tuesday. What kind of preamp and cables do I need to connect the ATEM mini? Then my MacBook Pro late 2013. Um, I think you need a USB to USB C, a USB A to a USB C uh, cable. You know, it's it's a USB C. I don't know if it will see it. Um, I know that my 2015 Mac does not see my mini. So, so, um, you know, so I think that you just have to, uh, you know, I'm not certain that the, that the third, the 2013 will see the mini um, because I, my 2015 can't see it. I haven't been able to figure out how to get the, the, my, my A10 mini to show up on my 2015. Other people, have anybody had success on the mini going into older machines? Go ahead, Fenwick. Uh, uh, unrelated to the ATEM Mini to the computer, you're still going to have to get the PR40 into some sort of a microphone interface and yep. also changed into USB, you know, some sort of USB or, or, audio interface. Yeah, and you could probably, you know, one, I think one way folks are doing that here is with things like a Mix Pre, you know, going and then the headphone, you know, you have the output from Mix Pre going into the Mini. Um, is that what people are doing or are some people doing or are they going straight into the the other the other options are things on the lower end like the focus right scarlet uh and also a, a basic mixer like the yamaha uh, mm -hmm. three channel uh what is it uh ago6 yep yep like absolutely Boom. yep there's a there's fun with showing another one so you get some kind of audio interface that's going to convert it to usb so the, focus rights the solos the the, the Yamaha mixers, Behringer mixers, they all, there's a lot of them in the $40, $50 range that can get it in there. It might be a little messier, um, but it, it definitely uh, can get there. Anyway, next question. Uh, next question. Uh, okay, this is one that's been coming back and been edited and we've ran out of time multiple times. Based on your personal experience from A. Mitchells, and, and I know for a fact, Alex, that 
Mitch, a mitchells is asking you and me and i only know that because it's, it's been three did, days now did, did did this but this question did did this come up in yesterday's conversation with phil philip it kind of again they're okay. specifically asking your your workflow okay based on your personal experience what's the best way to handle metadata at the acquisition for documentaries what's the best way to inter integrate it into your workflow perhaps a second hour acquisition strategies and editing workflow uh, uh, integration instead. Well, I think Lumberjack is the best way to do that. Yeah. You know? Like, like, you know, and that's why we, that's why we brought Philip on to talk about it. I, I wasn't here. I apologize. I, I apologize. We didn't, maybe we didn't dig into it enough with him, uh, to, you know, to go back. Well, one you of need, the things you need that... something that's, that's dedicated to pulling that metadata in, um, you can do it with a lot of other things. You can, I mean, I've seen people do it with Excel sheets, you know, of, of, you know, typing everything in, you know, where you're, you know, so there's a lot of ways of doing it in a very hard way. It's just that, that Philip figured out a way to do it in a relatively easy way to do it. I mean, in, in, but you have to have, I usually have somebody typing it down. It's not me. It's usually somebody who's dedicated to writing down notes and, and script notes and so on and so forth. Go ahead, Bill. I think the most important thing is just to be really to be aware that it's there and the possibilities of it, because there are so many possibilities for metadata that people just aren't taking advantage of. Real quick story. Uh, I had my first DSLR and I was helping some photographers with video and they helped me with that. And they said, one of the things to do is set my name in the camera, right? Months later, I was looking on YouTube at a video I had done through that 5D Mark II. And when I got down into the metadata, it said photographer Bill Davis. It had carried the metadata from that one day where I set it on my DSLR all the way through my production pipeline and all the way out to the web. So it's just to be aware of what's going on with metadata. It's very important. Well, yeah, and, and I think that, again, you most of the time you have to have this gets into people always wonder when you go onto a set why you why you don't have enough you know like, oh, you don't those people aren't doing something all the time. So we don't need to have them, you know, and that's crazy you know like, like you know like that's how you have that you, you events that work and shoots that work do have a certain number of people that are waiting to fix things and waiting to do things and waiting to grab those things and it is an added expense and it is worth it you know like and and a lot of times you know pas and lower paid folks that are there that are that are able to you know that are able-bodied and smart and can grab onto the data that they're trained to do that is the grease that makes everything work. When you don't have a bunch of, P, you know, a couple of PAs and a couple other people that can do smaller operations, it's like running an engine without any grease, you know, any, any kind of lubrication you know, to, to make it all work. And so people get into this thing where they nitpick and they, and they cut those things out. And they only want to, you know, they only want the people who are working all the time. When you have that, you end up with losing all that data. You end up with mistakes. You end up with when you're, when you're understaffed in these events. So a lot of times it's going to look that way. You know, and so when you're so to get back to this, you know, usually we have people whose job it is to type things in. And then we want to make sure that our times are set on our on our uh, cameras are, you know, like our, there's a whole bunch of other things that we want to do to make sure that everything's accurate. So you're grabbing onto those things. Um, those kinds of little settings are, are important in that process. Paul and then Colin, and then we're going to move on. OK, just a kind of a question at large. Is there a PC equivalent to Lumberjack? Man, that Lumberjack is incredible. That is awesome. There is an adapter <clears throat> that you can buy, Paul, actually. Uh, what you need to do is you need to go to an Apple store and buy a Macintosh. <laughs> it's just a dongle. It's called a the dongle. Lumberjack dongle, if you ask yeah, them. I've got an yeah. iMac 27. Maybe that'll run it. There I'll you try. go. There you go. Colin? Uh, Bill's experience notwithstanding, pursue your, your metadata acquisition intentionally. Look, yeah. look through your chain to make sure any transcoding you do doesn't overwrite your metadata because it's not a guaranteed thing that it's going to pass through your entire chain unmolested. That's yeah. magic when it does. Yeah. You're shy. Were you going to say something? No, I, I was just saying that it's a, it's a GUI, in, it's a web interface. So, I mean, you definitely have to edit it on a final because that's where yeah. the connection, but you can use the PC to log it if that's what they meant that's great next question uh philip shane here's a fun one any suggestions for the best microphones and other gear for recording an audio podcast outside in a new york city park where there's some wind and traffic noise no need to be to fully eliminate noise but as best voice quality as possible i would use an sm58 me too and headphones <laughs> like, like, yeah and, like, head, and, headphones, and here's yeah. the here's my thing and 
the audio people can say. I think part of the reason why radio people wear headphones is they get immediate feedback on all of their proximity. And when you make those people wear headphones, they'll know when the when the microphone all of a sudden turns into a gesture stick. Yeah, you know, they'll yeah. go, oh, I can't hear myself. I have to put this. Yeah, yeah exactly. Bill, Bill, and then you shine. And then Mickey. I just got distracted by something else in a question coming up, but um, wind socks, um, mm -hmm. sensitive microphones, if you're using them outdoors, they do make these things. The colloquial term for them is dead cat, and we're not trying to uh, annoy any pet owners, but they're a specifically made thing to knock down wind noise before it hits mm -hmm. a microphone element, and they do work really well. You shine. Uh, they have a great product by Apogee, and uh, the secret sauce is Sennheiser is doing uh, some voodoo magic there. It's a lavalier for one ninety nine, and with the lightning cable, you connect it to your phone and you put it here. You can add any you know wind screening on it, and it just works perfectly. I I will say that that um, the only time I the only time I think an, a lav sounds good is an anechoic chamber. <laughs> like, you know, like, like I, I, you know, just, it's just like, you know, like, I think that's pretty much the only time I think it sounds good. I no, mean, I people think, shoot I think wedding. It depends how you protect the wind from it. You know, you can I think get... it, it's acceptable <laughs> everywhere else, but it's, it is like, it's such a, you I know, definitely like, it, wouldn't it's... use it in the New York City park for sure. No, I, the, the, the only thing I'd say about labs is just, it, it is. And if you have to have that, but I think that oftentimes if we're doing a podcast again, I would rather outside, I would go, well, I can't really, you don't see a lot of even people in the press doing that because it's just really hard. You have wind, there's a lot of distance. As soon as you start increasing the distance from the, from the speaker, uh, the, you know, we start losing that, but I agree with you that there are times and, and you want it to be low. If you're doing a podcast, I guess I would say when someone says podcast, 95 to 99% of the people who are going to get your podcast are going to listen to it. They're not going to watch it. I built a, I built the first video podcast. No one watches them. They listen to them. I mean, some people watch them, but most people listen to them. So then you say, I'm going to now prioritize audio. As soon as you prioritize audio, you should stop worrying about how it looks. And you should, so for a wedding, as you were saying, Yashai, I completely agree with you that, you know, a lav, hidden, all that stuff makes sense in keeping it low profile. As soon as someone says podcast for me, I go, okay, I'm gonna prioritize the audio. As soon as I prioritize the audio, I'm gonna move, especially outside to something handheld that I can get really close to the person, um, you know, to make it work because the audio is going to be far more important. If you actually even take like this week with George Stephanopoulos or whatever, close your eyes and watch and listen to it, it's horrible. <laughs> you know, like like it's a, it's a horrible audio, you know, and, and that's in a studio, you know, and, and but but it's, it's because it's it's primarily a video. It doesn't make any sense that it's primarily video, but it is primarily video. I, I agree with you, Alex, but I just want to add because the proximity is really critical when you are doing past podcast for an hour. And the nice thing about the lavalier is stay in, in exact distance to the mouth, which is right. contributing to the quality, too. Yeah, and it's the exact I, distance, but it's too far of a distance. But, but I would I would say that if I was going to if I wanted to lean that way, I'd go to a headset. You know where I can just put a head, you know, get that close, you know, and then then you can get a little put a little something on it. But anyway, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I totally totally agree with Alex that for a podcast, I don't want the I don't want the microphone element um, diaphragm that small. Right. I I want and then, detail and then in far there. away and then far yeah. away. You know, both and of those things of, together. In terms of mic choice, um, yeah, SN58 would be a good choice, but I would highly suggest the Sennheiser MD46. And um, in terms of other, he asked also about other gear that would be needed. If you need to, to need it to be wireless, a couple of plug plug on tra transmitters um, and a field recorder. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to comment on exactly what if we don't know the price point that that um, he's working <laughs> with. Exactly. I mean, I, I, all I've used is field, for field recorders for the last 15 years has been sound devices. So I don't really I mean, I've yeah. used Zooms. I use Zooms in Africa because I feel like I can throw them away if I was being chased by somebody. So, so that's you know the sound devices ones I'd feel bad. Yeah, about. and the same so, same but, the same deal with yeah. wireless systems because like you could spend you could spend five hundred six hundred dollars on a wireless system. You could go to two thousand dollars per channel and, on a wireless system. And especially outside, I would be very I'd be very careful about using wireless systems. Just in New York, in, in New York, it, you you're gonna need a really good one, or you're gonna end up with interference you know and i mean I, I almost guaranteed you know so i i only use wireless if people are roaming like if people are if, if someone's going to sit i want to put them on i want to wire them you know if they're a really high profile individual and they're going to be walking around in between or whatever and we have a accident 
you know, I'll put them on, I'll put them on wireless, but outside of that, I want them on a wire because it's just, oh my gosh, there's so many things that can go wrong, you know, with wireless that, you know, if, if it, if it matters, you just get them on wires if you can. Um, Steven, 15 seconds. I'm just going to say, if you want the good stuff and you're doing a one thing, rent it. Yeah. If you're going to do it all, the, yeah, if you're doing it all, the, if you're going to do it, if you want to experiment, if you don't know how many times you're going to do it, audio equipment is not expensive to rent. Um, you know, so a lot of these things can be relatively inexpensive to get. Yeah, uh, if you're in then, New York, um, hit up the guys at Gotham Sound. Yep. Gotham, Gotham Sound. Absolutely. Um, they are the standard. All right. Next question. Carl, our own Carl Guest says, as we're talking on Zoom calls these days, what tips does Bill Davis have for taking care of your voice? Go, Bill. Okay, the, the most important thing, and it was the example that I gave when I did the voiceover thing, it, your voice is muscles and the rest of that. You wouldn't be surprised at all if you got up today having had no practice time and went out and sprinted for a half an hour if all of your muscles were killing you the next day. Right. We expect that. Well, it's the same thing with your voice, everything from your diaphragm through your larynx, through jaw muscles and the rest of that. If you, you abuse it the first time without any conditioning, it's going to kind of fail on you. So what you want to do is start out slowly. If you want if you're going to do a lot of out loud stuff, just practice for maybe 10 minutes a day, take a day off every once in a while and then extend that to 15 minutes a day for the second week and 30 minutes a day after that. And eventually you will build up to being able to sustain vocal performance longer without as much fatigue. And, and I guess the other thing that I would say is I, I drink a lot of, not hot, not cold, but lukewarm liquids a lot all day, you know, just to keep things going. Um, and I put lemons in them a lot. I have a lemon tree. <laughs> so I put lemon, but a lemon, but a lemon, uh, but I put a lot of, I put a, like a slice of lemon in all the time. It, there's something about the citrus that helps me a lot when I'm having, if I'm feeling like it's rough, but tea is, tea is a pretty uh, powerful tool for me to do that. Um, and the other thing that is being able to, uh, have a good mic and get a sense of where you're at volume wise, you know, not over speaking is something that I, I see a lot of people do when they get tired as they don't have good audio and they, you know, they start talking louder and that louder makes it harder to, to handle. You were going to say something, Carl? Yeah. There's a trick that I picked up from my, one of my business partners who used to do business week ABC in New York, which is when you're rushed uh, and she was going on air at three 30 in the morning and, Springsteen went till about 2.30, so she had to rush over to work, is to take a pen and put it in your mouth and just talk through the pen as a way of opening up your airwaves. It's, it's you know, it's a hack. Um, and I agree with, I agree with Bill, build it up over time. But, when I, you know, if you have to hack, you do. When I, when I did, when I do voiceovers, uh, this will look silly when I do it, but it, it, it works. Uh, similar to what you said there, when I do voiceovers, I count to 10 uh with my tongue stuck stuck out so one one two one two three one two three four and i do it really really and 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 by the by the time i get to 10 my addiction is you know five times better than it was you know when i when i started and just because it moves your teeth apart you know um so i, I have you ever officiated so you don't have a, a wedding pen, that way what yeah <laughs> have you officiated a wedding <laughs> that way my my <laughs> It's what brings us together today. My way, that blessed arrangement. All right, uh, next next question. That is a good one. Okay, Philip says uh, he ran a live stream test to YouTube using Mimo Live yesterday. The CPU on my 2019 15-inch MacBook Pro was hitting 150% most of the time. Anyone else seen this with Mimo Live? I've used Wirecast in the past without uh, this kind of CPU load? I think it has to, a lot to do with what you're doing. I mean, it's hard to tell what, you know, there are things that you're gonna ask us to do. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, there's, uh, there's a little monitor on top of, of the screen uh, that shows you what's, what utilization of various components of MEMA Live are, are, are doing. And some of them are the transparencies and the overlays use a lot of CPU. So, uh, they will advise you to, to, to skip those. So if you see something, you know, some some layer that you're using is really a hog in the CPU, just don't use that if you can. Yep, yep absolutely. You shy? Uh, I'll, I'll recommend to try Ecamm Live and see if, do the same task and see what's the CPU load. I don't know if, if uh, Mimo Live is that optimized for the Mac operating system. That's all I can say. I know yeah. that Felipe really likes it. 
I think that I, I think you just have to with with all of these things. You have to, the hard part with software switchers is that you do have to be more technical and pay more attention to what each operation does. And so, to get back to Mike's point, look at what those are. What what is he, how is each operation affecting your uh, overall load? And then you get a sense of what you can and can't do inside of those. With hardware, you just kind of if it if it turns on, it's on. And it's limited. It doesn't do as much. But it, it if it if it's doing it, it's doing it. Go ahead, Victor. And I've then, had good luck with. Wait. I've had good luck with something called Turbo Boost Switcher Pro. I'll put a link. Uh, it does tend to tame things. Even like during these calls, I've seen a big difference in my CPU load and fan speed. By the way, for noise. Yep. Um, uh, Fanwick, and then yeah, Lee, I'm, and then Leland. But but do it real quick. Fifteen seconds each. I bring this up because you mentioned it the other day. At one point, you said I don't think that input device is doing much to help. Uh, the process. And Philip is adding here that he's using an AJA as an input device. And I thought it was interesting that, you know, sometimes uh, it's contributing to the compression or making it worse. Well, it's either handing it done or it's, if, when it, I will say that when you take a camera and you hand it to one of these systems uncompressed, it's they're going to work harder. You know, at it, you know, they, like that's going to take more, more. Uh, I never thought of. Yeah, so it, it, they're they're gonna that's gonna that may, you may find that that's gonna be a, a heavier load for them than than if you're uh, doing a if you send an H two sixty four stream. Go ahead, Ellie. Um, I had the same problem with Wirecast, and one of the suggestions I uh, make is create a new user on your Mac and log in that user with nothing else running. Try and turn off as many background processes and applications and things like that. And just use that one um, user for streaming and see if that helps. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that if you're really serious about um, doing a software-based switcher, you really want that computer to be almost act, treated like an appliance. You know, that it, all it does is, it, you know, like the ones that we're building right now were for vMix, it's a vMix system doesn't do anything else. It doesn't have anything else installed. It's like, this is what I do, you know, is this one thing, you know, so that um, we can keep it clean. Go ahead, Leland. Yeah, just two primary things to watch for when it comes to software like that are the virus protection apps that you may have running. Those have to be shut down and always watch that Windows isn't trying to install an update. You should turn off updates whenever you're broadcasting because those can come in on the fly at any time. If you're, if you're on a PC, but Memo is of course Mac only. So we don't know what virus virus uh and apps i'm sorry are. i got totally understand <laughs> you never know what other apps you, lee covered it uh jeff jeff and tucker 15 seconds each quickly oh jeff you're you're muted jeff is wasting his seconds you're losing your sorry follow-up question about your compression uh if you bring it in as say from a web presenter and it's already compressed but then you do lower thirds or titling or shaping are you double compressing uh, you're going to double compress no matter what as it goes out. I mean, you, you are double compressing if you have compressed going in and then you're going to stream it out. Um, the, uh, I don't think you're going to see it. I don't think you're going to see a lot of difference if you're using a software-based encoder, um, you know, like on your Mac or PC. Uh, the quality of the, of the encodes are not, you know, you're, uh, the, level, the level of precision there isn't high enough to notice the difference between the two, I don't think. Um, and the, uh, and so I don't, I don't think that's, that's that, that much of a problem there. You know, it's going to be processing it. The resolution of all those graphics that you're doing is important to make sure that they're one-to-one -one. scaling is something by the way, that is really hard on a computer. So that's hardware encoders, everything else. When you take your 1080p image and output a 720p, that's work. You know, like when you do, you know, so, so look at whether you're changing scales on, on your graphics, motion graphics, or on your video, that is something that, especially on a laptop that doesn't have a powerful GPU that, that can, that operation can be handed to, um, that's going to be, um, just moving a resolution around is something that is a lot of work, uh, a lot of, you know, it's convolution kernels at that point. Uh, Tucker, uh, we're, we're hitting this one because a lot of people have it. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead Tucker, 15 seconds. I'm going to move on. Nope. You Sorry, got it. John. You nailed it go. with what you just said. Yeah. Okay, great. Next question. This will make up for it. It's an easy answer. Wooter from Amsterdam wants to know, can we do an, a second hour on the use yeah, of scopes? Yeah, we need to do one on, we need to do one on, on, on audio scopes and one on video scopes. Oh, we're working on it. I just, I just want to make sure we have the right people lined up that can, um, talk to it. So I'm, I'm trying to, you know, just find people that really specialize in this. Um, and if people here pick, hit me up on discord, if you really feel like you have a strong, uh, this is really an area of strength that you can really technically talk to the scopes. 
um, you know, I can talk to them on how I use them. And maybe that's enough for the first hour. Or there's enough of us that use them that, that we could do it for the first hour. But what I was trying to do is get, for instance, what I'm working on right now is trying to get a company like Fabrics to come on and talk about video scopes, because they'll be able to technically like really tie all that stuff in for us. Um, and I just, I'm just trying to work out um, getting to the right person to set that up. Same thing with audio scopes. Go ahead, Tucker, real quick. Um, I wouldn't mind there being a kind of a first, first, second hour on mm -hmm. scopes that is your perspective and then bring, and that'll generate a lot of, of yeah. thought process around it okay. and then have Fabrics come in so we can, and then yeah. it'll fill in and answer a lot of questions. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So we'll, we'll work on getting that in the next, within the next month. Uh, next question. Jeff Francis says, what is ping and how can I reduce it? And then he gives some a uh, 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 recipe here. He's got Ethernet, Mac 2016 MacBook Pro, mm -hmm. Airport Extreme, Spectrum provided cable, and he's getting Tucker? 24 to 36 milliseconds. Ping is Marco Polo. Um, so it's ping is your computer saying, "Hey, you there?" And then the other the system on the other end saying, "Yep, I'm here." And it's just a, a measure of how long that took. Um, so that is what ping is. As far as when you start talking about specific ping times, there's uh, there's a, a ton of different things. Like if you talk about the, the the network transport between me and you right now, there's probably three, four hundred devices between there, if not more. Um, and your ping, whenever you know, especially whenever you pull up like speedtest.net and and go ping go, it goes to a local server and gives you a ping time there that may not be in your actual path um that you that you really care about um there's tools like ping plotter that go and they basically look at every hop between you and whatever destination you want um I, i've done a lot of teaching at network operation centers of how to utilize network tools and really you have to understand what your what you're trying to test um, and what what are you looking for by doing this ping test and what is the expected result and know okay what is good what is bad um and it, it gets really you, deep but do you, do you want to talk about trace routes at all as well yeah um uh, trace route is basically how you figure out what that path is um so uh, that's the great thing about tools like ping plotter is they basically do a trace route and then every hop which uh when you talk about a hop it is everything that is taking the traffic and rerouting it to a new location it shows up in a trace route and so um, basically, you typically with a tool like ping plotter, it looks and it says first hop is this my ping time to that first hop is x. And then my next hop is this it's ping time is this and you can actually look at your entire path and see it's, you know, 10 milliseconds, three milliseconds, three milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, three milliseconds, three, mill you can start to see where you have problems so that you can kind of affect it. But as far as just talking about how to make it better. Um, it really comes down to what's your transport. Um, I would say hit us up on Discord if, if you have questions about your specific situation. Colin, did you want to add anything, uh, 15 seconds? I think Tucker co covered most everything. The one point to be made here, I guess, is that you have control over your network and not much else. Yep. You, yep, can, you can choose your upstream, your ISP that provides you the best connectivity. But on your network, there are things you can do. Uh, make sure that you're, I mean, we, we can talk about uh, home network hardware and that sort of thing. But yes, I think Tucker's got it right. Let's yep. just bring that up on Discord and, and yep. run with it there. Sounds good. Next question. Kevin McArdle says, has anyone used the newer Apple TVs with the Sienna NDI app for a deployment? Just curious, as this is technically the cheapest way to get a screen set up with an NDI decoder. I don't think any of us have used it. I mean, I use the, so I use the AirPlay all the time. I mean, what I have is set up for, for if I have a device, we use this in studios all the time. We put the air, we put the Apple TVs right under the desk. We have uh, an HDMI out of there that we run back, you know, convert it to STI or whatever, put it into our switcher. And then you just open up stuff and AirPlay to it. And it's a great way to grab screens. As far as um, uh, we haven't tried to do it with NDI though. And I don't, yeah, I don't, obviously no one here has. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, guy. Yeah, I was beta testing it when Mark Gilbert had it, and I just fired up my 4K Apple TV downstairs. Um, I mean, this is actually a picture 
of my iPhone transporting over there. And this was just over Wi-Fi and it, it worked great. So it's an, for 99 bucks, uh, if you already have the Apple TV. So I think those are like 199 or something like that. That's a pretty inexpensive way to get NDI to a, especially to a monitor that already has that. That's great. There you go. Next question. Uh, Robert Baker says uh, he's planning for outdoor services. Any recommendation on size and type of large screen for a drive-in movie style viewing supporting about 150 cars? I think the thing to think about is if you're, if you're going to build that screen or you're going to use a blow up, you know, blow up is our screens that we, a lot of us have used at some point or another. I, we did a, uh, um, I, we were contracted to do a, a, a film, a 4K, 4K projection in Angkor Wat, in Cambodia, um, you know, at, you know, right next to Elephant Terrace. And uh, we used a 30 foot blow up screen. Uh, the only thing I'll say about those is to remember that, think about wind direction. <laughs> you can tie them down, but they're still big sails and they're not very heavy. And we de definitely had them tied down, but we were fortunate that the wind was going across them. But what happens when the wind goes into them is A, they're a little bit of a, it's not that they're gonna blow away, it's that you get a variance of about a foot in the in the screen. And so parts of the screen are, are in focus and parts are not. So um, we were fortunate on the outdoor ones. We did a couple in Angkor Wat and a couple in Batam Bang. Um, and all of those were uh, uh, turned out to be fine. But while we were setting it up, we were getting a lot of back and forth over those. And that was for 2000 people. I mean, you know, they were not, you know, for 10 people. So that was a 30 foot screen. Um, as the screens get bigger, you need more infrastructure and you just need to know that that, you know, it's a, it's a big, it becomes a big project pretty quickly to have a screen for um, a large number of people. Although I think a 30 foot screen would probably be okay as a, Hey, we had a great time with 150. Uh, if you really want to make it great and make it even bigger, just know that that becomes a, a real logistics project. It's not, it's not like a, Oh, we're going to rent something and put it up uh, Roscoe and then bill. Yeah. I just did a site walk for 145 cars, 16 by 25 foot screen was the minimum and they were hopefully going bigger than that but cost is an issue at a university using an open parking lot against the side yep oh, you, you you muted in the middle of that so um bill go ahead and then the last thing ansi lumens becomes a huge deal because if you're doing anything during the day trying to get enough brightness on the screen so that people can see that is going to be a massive undertaking i remember the days of trying to do stacked projectors even to get in a relatively controlled thing, enough lumen so people could see the image. And, and to put it in perspective, we had the, in, in Cambodia, we had two 25,000 lumen um, Barco projectors that were on top of each other, uh, you know, uh, projecting into that screen and it was not viewable during the day. <laughs> it was, you know, like it was, it was, I mean, you could, you could kind of see the image during the day enough for us to uh, align the projectors, but that's about as, those are pretty powerful projectors too. Um, and so uh, in daylight, it was not effective. Uh, once we got to magic hour, it was, it was watchable. And uh, at night it was amazing, you know? So, uh, so anyway, so uh, that's uh, next question. Curtis Scott says, I have a customer that is looking to have 4K content sent from a media closet to their TV over their fireplace. What hardware would you recommend? We have one Cat6 and one RGB from the closet to the TV about 50 feet away. Or about 50, oh, this is a spinal tap moment. I think they mean feet. I think they're I saying think it's feet. Yeah. About or it's a 50 feet. inch TV and it's spinal uh, tap. And I it's think a, I'm going to say, I think it's about 50 feet. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. call that feet. Okay. So does that, how, how would someone route 4k over cat six cat six? Can you use like an HDMI to cat six adapter? I'm, a, I'm imagining something like that yeah, exists ahead, somewhere it. in the world. Yeah. Would the, the Geffen boxes help in this situation? Some, are they 4k? I, I, that's the only question I have. I, the, I, I the think Geffen I've seen ones, 4k ones. They might have 4k. The, the Geffen ones I, I have are 1080 uh, Tucker. There's a couple of different ways. Um, but the, the way that we would have done it in the integration side is we would probably use the cat six and do HD base T. Um, and HD base T is you could do 4k 60. Um, depending on which chips you have. And that, that cable length um, is, is pretty short. But if you get up near the 300 foot mark, um, you have to get real specific on your cable. Leland? Yeah, just some of these newer 4K HDMI to USB devices also have a monitor out HDMI that could be used for that type of access. So be an option. Great. 
Uh, next question. I'm just curious, does that stuff bypass all the um, DHCP? Absolutely um, not. Yep. Oh, nope. Okay. Moving Absolutely on. not. A. Mitchell says, speaking of Hamilton, does anyone know if people involved in the production were actually paid properly based on the new packaging and distribution? Perhaps a question on general pay rate rules I, and licensing. I don't know what they were paid, but I'm sure they were. <laughs> like, like at that, I mean, I, I'm certain that the, the, there was no, I mean, I think that they, you know, the, the, they shot that, they shot that only for TV. It was a TV production. It's not like they had room, they, they had some, they were collecting content during the, the shoots uh, that they shot that whole thing specifically for a TV release at the, you know, with the original actors, you know, set up to capture it. Um, so I'm absolutely certain that there was an incredible amount of contract negotiation related to, um, you know, everybody I'm sure made out well in that, because I, I mean, it, the, the hard part is when you, especially in those negotiations, when you already know you have the hottest play on the earth, um, and you're one of the actors that they're negotiating with, you have a lot of leverage. <laughs> so, so I don't think that they got run over. So, uh, um, you know, so I'm sure that they probably just on the, my guess is, is just on the contract for the show, not the, not the play, but the, I'm sure they, they're making good money on the show, but I would guess that just on the contract for the, the, tele, the televised version, they would probably, if they lived well, they probably never have to work again all of the actors that are involved, all the major actors that are involved in that. Um, that's my relatively- That's why I'm here guess. every morning, Alex. <laughs> anyway, next, my uh, but I, don't, I, I, think that, I think they're doing okay. Um, next question. Will Doggett says, suggestions on a dual input RTMP solution for redundancy. So switch between two RTMP encoders and pass through to RTMP output, preferably in the cloud. AWS, Media Live. Like that's, I mean, that's the, I mean, that would be the one that I would use. Any, any other one? I, I don't, I, you know, we, they are coming, they've agreed to come on, by the way, I'm just figuring out the schedule. So the guys from AWS are going to come on. We'll talk about, we'll talk about this in more detail. Um, but, you know, I don't, you can use Wowza as well. I don't have as much experience with Wowza, but, but Wowza and AWS are going to be your two cloud options, in my opinion, of multiple RTMP inputs or as many RTMP inputs as you want. Uh, and being able to switch, you will not switch seamlessly there. When you're switching in the cloud, there's a, you know, there's a little bit of a delay in that, in that uh, request. So there'll be a second or two, you know, it's, it's, it's for an emergency. Now you can get into, um, that's assuming that you want to switch between them. Um, uh, the failovers is a whole nother conversation. <laughs> you know, like, you know, you have to build, there's very specialized subsystems that, that, that deal with uh, automatic fail, failover from one to the other. Uh, any, anyone else? No. Okay. That's, that's our two cents, but we'll get eight. The guys from AWS are going to come on in the next couple of weeks. I just have to schedule it, but they, I was just having a meeting with them over some other stuff and they're willing to come through and do a talk. And I'm going to walk you through how, how I do some of the stuff that I'm doing with it um, soon, which is very simple, very simple things, not nothing complicated, but just how we, I do my basic setup. Uh, next question. Uh, Stan Chan, by the way, Stan, Hey, you're very close to me up in Roseville. I'm actually in Rancho. Uh, Stan Chan says, is there a tool on the Mac to gather all your windows on multiple monitors to your current active one? Uh, go ahead, Colin. It's built right into the display's control panel. Are you talking gather windows? System settings, yeah. It'll gather windows into which, whichever window you You can gather all the preference panes, but it won't gather all the... Oh, I it'll gather all the, window, all the window, all the open windows. Okay. Try it. We'll check that out. We'll check that it out. Works. I've, only, I've only I've only tried to do it with pe preference panes. I'm like, oh, all the preference panes are here. So anyway, so that that's good. That's no, cool. it works. I'll, I'll give it a shot. Okay. Next question. Uh, John Gerard says, "Do you think 3D in movies is dead? What are your thoughts? I watched the Elton John concert that he shot totally in 3D on my Google Daydream view. Very cool. What kind of cameras do you think they used?" Uh, two questions there, by the way, John. Yeah, just, yeah <laughs> I, I think that I think that what was interesting is is that all the three D work that we did set us up for being successful with VR because the VR is a much better experience for three D. Like when you see stuff shot in three D um, uh, in VR, uh, it, even if it's one eighty, you know, stereo, uh, it's very compelling. And I've I've watched a couple things that were like Avatar on VR is cool. Um, you know, much better than the film experience. Uh, and so, so VR, I think, is a place where a lot of the 3D stuff can, can go. I think that 
for theaters, I I only went to a couple of them and I stopped being willing to pay or deal with it. Um, I have glasses. And so it, it, I think anybody, I think that glasses are a real problem for VR and for stereo because there's a bunch of us that if you can't figure out how to give it, give it to us, it just becomes a real hardship for a lot of people. Like I don't use VR very often because they don't put a diopter in the Oculus, you know, or the, or the HTC, you know, if they just put, or the HTC, I think might have one, but Oculus doesn't put a diopter like the Samsung gear did, which is a little, little scroll so I can focus things in without my glasses. And because of that, I don't, I stopped, I just stopped using Oculus. You know, it was just too much of a pain. And so, uh, so I think that uh, glasses are a big problem. <laughs> it's, a, it's a large part, part of the population. And so uh, that I, that I think inhibits uh, a lot of, a lot of all of this. And I, I think that they need to be better at, you know, it's not a simple, it's a very simple piece of hardware that I, and I can't quite understand why more people don't add that. I think it's like designers that don't like the little knob or something like that, but it literally just stops my interest in using it at all. I don't know any other opinions about that. Um, I think that, you know, what, what ruined 3d was doing it cheaply. You know, that's, this is gets into like, you know, charging us a bunch and not shooting with true in true stereo. Um, you know, it, it, it is the part that, was was frustrating sky i know mad max was originally took like 10 years to create off of basically a storyboard they didn't even have a script until they had to insure it at the end and the director said if you want to put it in 3d you make it in 3d and that's what warner brothers ended up post producing it mad max the most recent one also that uh it's a gimmick but avatar really did the best and again sorry banging that drum they put it into the story so when you looked over the edge of that tree you right. really really felt the experience so i mean if if all 3d looked like avatar we'd all still be watching it but but if it but the way that it was hacked up by you know cheaply and trying to go back and grab other ones and put them on 2d cards and everything else yeah. it, it just destroyed the it, they, they they destroyed their own market you know that was and 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 cameron was saying that during the whole thing go ahead nick and then chris and then we're going to move on we're going to go into speed round yeah, I was just going to say that the vast majority of quote unquote 3D movies were shot 2D. I mean, basically all the Marvel movies, etc. I mean, Avatar was for the most part rendered. I mean, the, the most of the shots in Avatar were rendered from computers. So you could dial in absolutely yep. perfect 3D for all of those shots. Um, and that's part of what made it so amazing. But most live action gets shot 2D and literally is remade a second time. Smoke is erased and then re-added in by, you know, there's entirely, you know, companies dedicated to doing I, stereo conversion, so. And I will, the last thing I'll say about that is, you know, I went down and I did 3D training at Sony, at Sony Studios. They had this little uh, in, in, invitational, you could go down and spend, I think it was a day or two days or something like that with them. And they had it down pat by the time I got there. And it was amazing. When you see 3D shot properly with two cameras, like, and basically it's, it's through a, a, a mirror. So one, one, basically a little teleprompter, almost like a little, little mirror. You have one's pointed up and one's pointed forward and everything's all synced together and you can control convergence and you can control interaxial distance and you can do all the things that you need to do. Uh, when you see that, it is stunning like uncompressed it coming out two cameras in stereo it is stunning and you would want to watch everything that way it's just that by the time it gets to you it's all messed up <laughs> go ahead chris oh. and then and then we're gonna move on i oh, yield my oh, time I also I'm sorry i, I yield my time i'll, okay. I'll just go right, to the next let's, let's go into speed round next question will dog it uh how are you using a video hub or similar routing solution live how does it tie into your a10 I put all my inputs and outputs through my hub, and then I feed the the I feed the ATEM um, as much as I need to into that from that hub. It's a little hard with a constellation because there's so many inputs, but typically my hub is twice the size of my switcher. It's not not in the constellation, but with everything else, so that I have. But I pass all those inputs through into the switcher. I then take most of the returns of the switcher and put them back into the hub, and then I um, and then I use it that way. And the reason for that is now I don't have to mess with it. Like if I want to change well, what inputs are going into my switcher or what else I'm doing, or I want to route things to monitors that don't have to do with the switcher, all of those things are now completely fluid for me to, to do that. Sometimes we will break those up so that we have one 40 by 40 router that's managing just monitoring and another 40 by 40 router that's managing signal. Um, to make it more complicated, sometimes we have a primary backup on the signal and then one on just monitoring. So we can have three, four uh, of those 40 by 40s. Um, we like keeping them separate because if something goes wrong, which hasn't happened in those smaller ones, but could, 
um, we have a lot of redundancy. To, to add redundancy, you, you start going into patch bays. So you start building patch bays that go into those, those routers and those um, patch bays allow us to, I get them um, non-normaled. So that means that if I pull a pin out, there's no signal. Like I don't like patch bays that are, that are um, normal where you, you pull it out and it passes the, some other signal through it because that, that is scary to me. <laughs> you know, so, you know I, I, I'm saying it, it's, it's my version is much more manual and much, but it's very visible. I can, you know, we get different color patch uh, pins and, and, you know, you know, what's going on. It means that if I'm in a rehearsal for a very high profile event, I can pull this pin out and I know that the satellite truck is not getting any footage, you know, like it's, you know, and, and I can pull these things out and I just pop them out and, and put them back in. Um, and then with cables, you can reroute it. That means that you have a hard, a way to hard route if something goes wrong and everything, you, you literally have a passive unpowered way to move signals back and forth with a patch panel. So um, those are kind of the, the layers of, of what I do, um, you know, for larger systems um, and how I work on it. I don't, it's very hard for me to work without a router at this point. Go ahead, Tucker. Yeah, with uh, just exactly what you said, one of the big reasons why we uh, will use them is for automation. So you do automation in your switcher and then you can choose what input goes to it and not have to adjust your automation downline. Yep, absolutely. Next question. Uh, Joshua Dotel says, what is the best way to get started with live streaming as a developer? Live streaming as a developer. I, said, I, think I, need, wet. I know I asked you to make short questions, but that's such a big question <laughs> that I have a hard time like figuring out the context. So let's bring that up another day, but add a little bit more context to that one. We'll let you go a little six, or seven lines to get context. I think it's an interesting question. I just don't know how to answer it. Now, next question. Uh, next question is uh, Stuart Fairweather says, for IP-based production, is there an audio to IP box, ideally, the sort of thing that would clip on the bottom of an SM58 and connect by Cat6 or even Wi-Fi for picking up atmospheric audio, not commentary? Um, well, I mean, the Audinate makes a two, I think they make a one channel and two channel output that has like a little box that's got an ethernet and you pop it into an output, um, as far as something really tiny that you're going to add to it. Of course, there's, you know, Rio boxes, uh, sound, um, studio technologies has their own, uh, I want to call it an MD4, but it's not, that's what sound devices did with theirs, but, but they have like four channel ones. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, those, uh, Audinate ABIOs will not do mic level. As far as I know, I think they're line level only. Okay. Um, RDL and uh, Hearback Technologies have a little, like, two-channel box. I'll put some links in there. He's doing, uh, Stuart put in the chat that he's doing Mike's uh, racetrack side. Nice. And and uh, Studio Technologies now makes a ton of Dante-empowered uh, hardware devices that we use for comms, we use for mic, mic inputs, and so on and so forth. And generally, they're well-built as well. Uh, Bill Davis? Not easy or cheap, but of course the Black Magic Mini converters often do uh, that translation into audio. So just look at Mac Black Magic Mini converter audio; you'll get some links. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For a non Dante solution. Yeah. Absolutely. Next question. Uh, it seems like we've talked about this. A Mitchell's again says, "Would it be good to have a second hour on acquisition strategies and editing workflow integration?" Yeah. I think it would. I think we okay. we we, we got to get a group together and and do it. I yeah. Well, let's well let's think through that one. I I, I agree that it's a good it's a good subject. It's not well documented <laughs> anywhere. So it's, he's he's bringing up a good point. Uh, next question. Uh, a Mitchell's again. When is the special second hour coming up on meters and scopes and bears? Oh my. In July. Ooh, in July. A definitive answer. In July. Uh, I'm again. I'm. I was trying to. I, I think that I'm. I'm going to take the coaching here of. Let's do a basic one that we just talk about how we use it, and then we'll bring yeah. we'll bring experts in for the Thanks second one. So that's going to make it easier. Uh, I'm going to miss a couple of days next week, so, and I kind of want to be here for that one. So it won't be next week, but it'll probably be the week after that. Next question. Further to the previous question about the 4K extender, would sending 1080 be easier and letting the TV do the upscaling? Oh, that just well, it's not going to look as good. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you got 4K and 4K, get 4K. You know, like figure, figure out the 4K. And we, there's some solutions there. Okay, next question. Last question that I have, Robert Baker says, outside of the Constellation, which other router might you recommend? Isn't the Constellation a switcher? Yeah, Constellation is a switcher. The... By the way, on that Video Hub question, it took me halfway through by before I realized that Video Hub is what uh, Blackmagic calls their routers. So yeah. in case anybody else missed that. Uh, Blackmagic makes a lot of different routers, and it's all I know how to use. 
like i mean we we have a utah scientific in in a couple of them that are like because it's way bigger uh then you know then it's like I, I think it's a 256 or 244 or something like 244 it's like a big uh router ross makes some good ones but once you get into the once you start getting into the the utah scientific ross and then up to grass valleys you're talking about real money you know like the, like you think of, you think i'm expensive when i talk about black magic wait until you start talking about like a you know a ross uh router now you're like in the 80 to one hundred twenty thousand dollar range for your router it's got a lot of tools in it that are really cool and we have installed them in a couple of locations but it's it's uh it's it's you start you know it gets more expensive go ahead tucker uh, Aja makes the Kumo series routers, which are yep. also really, really good. And the great thing is Blackmagic has put a lot of pressure on Aja as far as price point. So those yep. have come down and I think it is a slightly superior product, but not quite as easy to integrate into other systems. Yeah. I mean, and the big thing for me for, for my, the Blackmagic stuff is just that it, the open API makes it easier to, you know, get to it. You know, and so there's, I do think that the build quality on the AJA stuff is higher. Um, but I think that the, uh, uh, it's just not as easy to take over, you know, and we build, we build a lot of things that take them over. So we, you know, it's, it's super useful. Uh, next question. Last question again, Stephen Bauer says, uh, is your brother named Jack? Uh, is there a second one? Oh, wow. Now questions are popping in like crazy. Good no, those day. are, those are, they were already there that you just got Oh, okay. Late. Sorry. Is there a second hour for audio hijack? Uh, yeah, we we almost did it this week, but we'll do it soon. We just have to maybe even next week. I just have to make sure that all the audio hijack people are available. That's all. I just wanted to make sure that they're all in the same place, and uh, we were we were just trying to schedule that. But the audio hijack will come soon. Next question. Uh, Paul Walhuff says, uh, "Would you please ask panelists for a quick show of hands in the room who uses Max, who uses PC, who uses both, who uses Premiere?" That, Paul, that's a lot of questions. Final Cut, etc. I think it'd be, I think we could figure out a way to do that. It'd be interesting in general to have a series of polls, maybe one per day along those lines, just to oh, see that would what be kind of fun. Doing. What do you say, Alex? Um, yes, we should. Another Hold day. On. Yeah, I, um, I just realized we just had a little miscommunication. Steve, Steve Wright is in the, I'm, I'm a little distracted. Talk amongst yourselves. I, he's, in, he's in the wrong place. Okay, so I'm, I'm working on fixing that. Let me do this right now. Who uses Max exclusively? Show of hands on the panelists. Well, exclusively, primarily. Okay, primarily. Who uses PCs primarily? And who uses both regularly? Okay. And then I'm a, Mac uh, guy, I'm a Mac guy and I only switch for vMix. I have one machine just <laughs> dedicated for vMix because I got I'm tired of messing around. That's the only reason. Yeah. I got my little orphan child over there in the corner that I rarely talk to. <laughs> okay, hey, I who, raised that child. From you watch edit, you talk about. It's, it's I don't a know very how many well people here edit, very but how job. many people edit using Adobe Premiere primarily? And then how many use uh, Final Cut Pro primarily? You tried to hold your hand up, Sky. <laughs> and DaVinci? Uh, nobody. DaVinci Resolve. Yeah, okay, a couple of you. Totally bailed on Premiere. Scruton. Well, back to Windows. Element 3D doesn't work in DaVinci. When your mortgage is paid by Redmond, Washington. So you're saying you use Windows Movie Maker? There's a story there when the engineer came in and said, this is what a waveform is. And all the computer geeks went, what's that? Yeah, that's frightening. Oh no, that was reality. Right. It's so frightening. Okay, so Alex is trying to square. organize. So just in case so I, those people I, were I, I had done a test just, I had done a test with Steve yesterday and Steve doesn't use Zoom as much as we do. And uh, I did a test with Steve yesterday and I think he's in the wrong meeting. And I, if I leave that meeting to go into, if I jump in to talk to him, I will kill this, this meeting, which we've done in the past. So I'm, I'm just sending him a, the new thing and hopefully he'll be here in a minute um, as he uh, gets his email. We're, we're slowed down to the speed of email because I don't have his phone number. So we'll- uh, um, A location here in the Seattle area that has comms as a part of a conference meeting. Join oh, the meeting on an iPhone, Alex. Sorry? Sorry. You could join the other meeting with an iPhone. I mean, you know, and just not use the same computer. 
Uh, it's the right same there. account. The account will kill it. Yeah, you can't. Oh, okay. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't. Like it'll. That's what we we've done that before. Before seven o'clock. Fortunately, not after seven o'clock. I've learned. Don't do that. Don't 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 try to do anything. Uh, I basically don't try to do another another uh, connection. Well, let's okay. try and do a couple more questions while we're waiting for yep. Steve. Uh, Jeff Powers says best ways to keep the studio cool and quiet. Like a fan, uh, can a fan actually be used to move air around without causing noise in the mics? What are those really Gucci fans Dyson. that that you could put? Uh, Dyson, yeah. Dyson bladeless fans, yeah. I have they're a not, Dyson. They're here not silent though, because they actually have a fan in the bottom that propels the air up through the. Uh, blade, yeah, blade. but that, but that fan runs really slow. I got one right here, and it's yeah. it's about a quarter speed, and you can't hear it. So, yeah. it's it's I've had it for about three years now, and it's it's a good fan. It's just you got to keep it clean too. When it gets dirty, it gets noisier. So, but uh, Dyson is worth the price, a couple hundred bucks, and <clears throat> I have a Dyson. You can see it over there. See where I'm pointing? That's a Dyson. Man, it's so quiet, and it it's, has it's a more giant on the fact filter. It's more on the fact of when we're doing uh, sound checks, people are going, well, my air condi conditioner just kicked in. Is there, is there any way, you know, I suppose you can put up blankets and stuff like that around that, but is there a good way to actually- Yeah, it depends on how complex, how complex you want to get. So uh, doing a lot of voice work um, in these booths, there is an air handling system that has an input and an output. They are baffled, which means that there's usually a box. The air comes in, it goes through something, then it comes into the booth and the same thing on the outputs. And we use uh, very low noise fans. There are actually a lot of them and they're very cheap now because people uses them, use them for hydroponics. So you can find uh, silent fans much easier and better than you used to be able to. In studio situations, uh, there was a big change about 10, 15 years ago when people, when the air conditioning industry went from these huge monolithic things to what are called mini splits. And a mini split breaks the, uh, the condenser off of the fan unit. You can put a fan unit outside of a building and the split part inside and get much quieter, much lower levels of sound for air conditioning. And then if you take the mini split and you duct it with some turn some 90 degrees in the ductwork, you can really kick down the amount of uh, sound that an air conditioning system puts into any studio or voice booth or any kind of space like that. That's what I used to do. I'm interested in the, Chris Fritchie's new system. Chris. The, the Dyson okay. also has, uh, oops, sorry, Chris. Yeah, so I have a, you guys probably can't hear it, but I have one of the little stand-up units that we bought at Lowe's, enough to not really cool this room. And then we have a little bitty uh, box fan in front of it about three feet in front of it that then pushes that cold air around the room. Hasn't been enough to cool the room is the problem. When you get four people over here and all the lights are on, um, the guys are sweating. So we just bought a big window unit and it just gets put into the wall. It's relatively quiet, but it, it's, it's big enough to cool the room twice this size, which means we can cool the room down, then turn it off. And the room will stay cold for probably an hour and a half and we turn it on between takes. So that's what we do. Most people aren't in a big studio running ducks. I'm just and, in a garage. Yep. And we find, you know, I'll say, the only thing I'll say is that we find it tying it to the on-air button, uh, turning it on. Every time we turn on-air off, it turns the AC on is a really useful thing. So anyway, um, uh, we are now going to switch gears. Uh, we have Steve right here and uh, and ready, ready to roll. And um, so we're going to switch gears. We'll go ahead and uh, we're going to be talking. Yeah, there we go. We're going to go ahead and close up the YouTube.